people should understand this is just SWAT raids. This is ruination. These families, uh, in many cases, their lives were destroyed. They lost their jobs. They lost their income. They had to move. They were they were threatened and doxxed. It's, uh, it's really got an Orwellian taste to it. And it supports the notion that these are dangerous people that need to be watched. And, and what it really is doing is it's targeting middle America and just saying, if you love your country, regardless of who you vote for, if you love your country, uh, you're somehow a radical or you're dangerous. All right, folks, welcome to the Sean Spicer Show. Big week here. Later this week, Governor Mike Huckabee, Victor Davis Hanson. It's going to be a great week. But we kick it off today with Joe Hanneman of the Epic Times. They have a brand new documentary out, The Real Story of January 6th. It shows you things that I guarantee you've never seen before. Let's get into it with Joe. Joe, thanks for being with us. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I saw the movie and then I just I watched it again because it's sort of like I, there was so much to digest the first time that I wanted to see it again as we were getting ready to have our conversation. Um, let me just kick this off with like, what what was it about January 6th that made you want to dive deep into this subject? Well, when I was first uh, assigned to this beat, and at the time it wasn't a beat, but back in uh, late 2021, when we were coming up on the first anniversary uh, and the the more I dug into this and wrote my first few articles, it became very apparent that what was being put out to the American public, you know, but what I now call the mainstream narrative, uh, really wasn't reflective of what we were finding. And so that I dug deeper in our print articles. And as a result of that, you know, about the same time that the January 6th select committee was holding its first hearings, we decided to put together our first documentary and wanted to give people a little bit uh, wider view and maybe one that wasn't quite so slanted. Calling the January 6th investigation the biggest investigation in FBI history. There are more than 1,100 arrests and they show no signs of, of slowing down. When you take an oath, you have to abide by it. They're just going to identify you on video, arrest you, and then figure out what the evidence is after that. Those involved must be held accountable. You've been a reporter for a long time. You've covered a lot of subjects in a lot of different areas. Walk me through, first and foremost, I guess, where you put this story among the things that you've covered. It really stands head and shoulders above anything I've covered before. You know, I've been in journalism and communications for, well, this, this year will be my 40th year doing it. Not so you, all in. You started uh, when you were two. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've been doing this a long time, but this really is so bizarre and it is so uh, unusual that it's, it's doesn't really compare to anything else I've worked on. And, uh, you know, the more that I work on this, every dozen more stories that I publish, uh, it, it even gets, you know, strengthens me in that belief. It's, it's just very unusual. Yeah. Before we get too far, I just want to remind all the viewers that the link to all of this, to where you can watch it on the Epic Times, is, is in the show description on YouTube, Rumble, Apple. So if you're watching it on the first, go over to the places where it's streaming and you can get the links. Um, let me, the thing that was fascinating for me is as someone who watched January 6th unfold um, at the time, I thought it was very black and white. You were either a good person or a bad person. Uh, there was good and there was evil. What I think was so fascinating about this documentary is for the first time, at least that I've seen, and I, is that it really showed the gray, right? Um, and I was struck by something that you started the movie off with, which is like, you're, you're like, Hey, I'm not here to condone anyone's behavior. I'm not here to excuse it. I'm just here to get to the facts. I think for so many Americans, January 6th has become a black and white issue. Either these are people that were there to expose the truth and they were freedom fighters or they were evil, horrible people. And what I really got out of this was that there were some people who did some bad things. 
there were a lot of people who were just there and got caught up in some things. And the, the gray has um, shading, right? So some people got caught up a little bit more. Um, they're not completely innocent, but they definitely weren't deserving of massive punishment. And then there were people who literally were just standing on a, you know, a patch of grass on the mall. What, what do you want people to take away first and foremost? Well, what's been missing from the very beginning in the coverage of January 6th in general is perspective. Yeah. You know, a sense of perspective. Uh, there's been so much agenda driven communication surrounding it. And it really started, honestly, it started before any of the violence erupted at the Capitol. We were already seeing on, on certain websites that, that went out with stories, uh, quite frankly, that, that predated any of the breaches. So that there was going to be an effort to set the tone to set a narrative that, uh, you know, Speaker Nancy Pelosi actually used that term later on to protect the narrative. Well, the problem with narrative is it's not always true. So we wanted to be able to show what happens before the snippet of video that you're shown and what happened after and how does it fit into the big picture. And that's where the perspective comes in. And oftentimes that's where the true meaning is found. You, you can take a video, photographs, any kind of evidence, and you can make it seem like something it truly wasn't. And we've seen that time and time again in the prosecutions of, of many of the January 6th defendants is evidence that was skewed or twisted to, to uh, obtain a desired result. So uh, if, if people come to understand that there is much more to this, and there is a lot of gray, uh, and, and the, the, the easy uh, answers about who's bad, who's good, they, you, they just don't apply. You got, you got to have an open mind and, uh, and let the facts, you know, follow the facts wherever they go. And that's what we've tried to do. Hey, folks, are you looking to secure your financial future? I know during the Biden economy, that's something that all of us are trying to do more. I've added precious metals to my investment strategy. And the people that I trust to do that are the folks at Bishop Gold Group. Now, if you go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean, you can begin your journey as well with a special promotion. Or you can give them a call at 844-984-1616. These are the people that I picked up the phone. I called them. I walked through my particular situation. And we came up with a strategy. Now, maybe you have an IRA that you want to roll over. Maybe you just want to diversify your investments. But people at Bishop Gold Group are the people that I trust. Give them a call or go to the site bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean. You get on the phone, you talk about your particular situation, and they'll help you come up with a strategy. Maybe you keep some of the gold with you, maybe they do it for you, but you can work with them one-on-one -on -one to come up with a strategy that's good for you. So go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean to begin your journey to financial freedom through precious metals. Yeah, I think the word that you use, perspective, really fits here. When you took this issue on, how much did your mind change when you were done with this film versus when you first got assigned the first January 6th story? Did you, did you sort of, what, what was it in you, if anything, that changed? I never would have guessed that this story, this whole January 6th story, would become such, such a deep and complex story. Uh, from the, the first articles, I, I knew that we weren't being told what I sensed was the full truth, but I had absolutely no idea uh, of the, the twists and turns that we were going to encounter. And, and this is really why this is unusual in my entire career, is that uh, we've had you know, so many side stories and so many rabbit holes to go down and you know, so many angles to pursue that it's, it's, I mean, it's honestly can be mind numbing at times. And, and I, I feel for, for viewers and readers out there because, you know, you've got all these competing viewpoints and you've got all this information flying in the air and to, to try to cut through all that uh, can be difficult at times. So it, it really uh, gave me an appreciation that this issue is just going to stand out in history. Uh, it's, it's just unusual. And it's going to take us more time to sort it all out. You know, I'll tell you what I took away right off the bat was 
there's something that I don't know if I just have this naive view of like the criminal justice system. And obviously the last 12 to 24 months has shaded this a lot. But initially, if you'd asked me three years ago, uh, I would have said, or five, I don't know, I don't want to put a number on it. I'm sure viewers will kind of date me back. But I would have said the FBI is a noble organization. They go out there, they fight for protecting America. You show these raids that f people who were at um, attending January 6th uh, on the mall or at the Capitol grounds, the attacks, the SWAT tax that they had on these families blew my mind. I mean, I'm thinking to myself, none of these people posed a threat. They weren't, there's no like warrant out for them and, you know, APB that this is a dangerous person that's on the, on the cusp of hurting somebody or has a weapon that they're going to do something. And the tactics that were used that you guys show in the film was, I, I, I got to be honest with you, I, I thought it, I was disturbing. Yeah, the, the, some of the some of these uh, raid footage that we used in the film uh, was from Minnesota, from the case of the Westbury family, which uh, went through two SWAT raids six months apart. And the first one, uh, the FBI, of course, always shows up before dawn, and uh, they just absolutely blew in the front door with a battering ram. And before the the head of the household, Robert Westbury, was able to even get halfway down the stairs to see what was happening. His front door had been blown in and uh, the agents come in weapons hot, pointing them at anyone that's in their path and uh, went searching throughout the house looking for one of the sons in the case. And it's, uh, you know, none of the folks in this family had any kind of a criminal record, he had a had a uh, an army veteran who served honorably uh, and, and, you know, his bedroom door was was kicked in and he was staring down the barrel of an M4. And, you know, he was just like, put his hands up and saying, hey, just please take 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 me out of the sights of that rifle. I'll do whatever you want. Right. Uh, and so, th you know, these types of things have really seared into each member of this family. And they're not alone. The Munn family that we, we yeah. uh, pro profiled in this, you know, misdemeanor charges. They ended up taking a plea for a petty misdemeanor. Uh, they experienced three SWAT raids simultaneously in two different states. So you had three households of the family members and, uh, you know, you had situations with one of the daughters, her own children uh, were not allowed to you know, ho hold hands with each other or get any comfort. They had to stand in between tactical agents uh, and watch their mother get cuffed. And it, it just, uh, it, it kind of boggles the mind when you think about that, uh, that, that, you know, what could be more innocent than a child wondering what's going on? Why would you, need to separate them from each other, uh, you know, thinks that they're going to do something. Uh, so it, it really, it, it calls into question the logic behind using those kind of tactics against people who not only have no criminal records, but they're not violent people at all. If I recall, there was no warrant or, I mean, in one of them, they were like, what are we charged with? What's, what are we, what's the deal? And they were just taken away. It wasn't unusual in, in a lot of these cases when people would ask to see warrants, they were just ignored or told no. I know that happened in the case of uh, Tom Caldwell, who was tried in the first Oath Keepers trial, although he is, he's not an Oath Keeper. Uh, he asked that question and wanted to know what was going on. And, and this was after he got, uh, and this is a totally disabled 69-year-old man thrown up on the hood of a, an FBI sedan uh, and then eventually put in the back of a put in the back of a vehicle. Uh, you know, you, we're not we're not telling you. We don't get, we have to show you a warrant. And sometimes they they didn't show them at all. Or eventually it was much later that uh, anything was produced. Well, I know that you know you mentioned the the Munn family and and you chronicle them throughout the movie. Just sort of that they had to move. Uh, their neighbors had made obvious threats against them. There were posts against them. Uh, what were they, what were, just walk viewers through, like, what was their crime? Well, they took a trip to uh, D.C. It was really a, a graduation, uh, pre-graduation gift for two of their daughters. Uh, and, you know, the, Tom Munn is has been a history buff and, you know, very big on the Constitution, served in the National Guard as a first responder. Uh, and so because of uh, their concerns about election security and fraud, 
in the 2020 presidential election. They thought it was their purpose to go there and to observe the, the lodging of objections. And so they did. Now they went into the Capitol. They went through a, a window that had been broken out, uh, which they freely admitted in their, in their case. But uh, once they were inside, uh, really, the, the most exciting thing they did was to pick up trash in the Capitol Visitor Center. They noticed that there was detritus thrown about, and so they gathered that up while they were trying to find a way out. You know, they sensed the situation was out of control and they wanted to get out of the building. Uh, and I believe they spent a total of 52 minutes inside. And, uh, you know, initially the government came at them with multiple charges, uh, but they... I think wisely decided to take a plea for the petty misdemeanor, uh, because in most cases uh, you get much more severe punishment if you go to trial and you lose, and just about everybody that's gone to trial has lost. So uh, you know, but you know, they did you no know, violence, no vandalism, and on the contrary, they tried to help. I, I, let me ask you this: Is your you, you have this long history of of journalism? As you're approaching this story, how much is this when you see this? Like I, I, I'm watching the film, and if it what that's the why I'm urging people to to actually watch this is that like when you see these raids, you're going, there's no way, there's no way these people like you you look at the Munn family and the daughter. I mean, they just they're not they with all due respect, they don't look like they could really overcome much in terms of like they're not they're not like fitness gurus or anything like that. And that's no sign of disrespect to them. But these are not people that would pose a, a physical, intimidating threat to anybody if you're seeing them walking down the street. And yet the way that law enforcement approached them made them seem like, you know, they were they were Hannibal Lecter, like they had to be overcome. And, you know, they were a huge threat. As you as a journalist, do you feel like, like you start watching this and you start interviewing these people? What's going through your mind? Because you are, are you going, there's no way this, I, I, there's gotta be more to this or are you like, how, I mean, just as somebody who's been covering things for a long time, what's your initial reaction as you see some of this unfold? All right, folks, if you've been watching the show for a while, you've heard me talk about my friend, Leo Grillo. He rescued a Doberman years ago and he named the dog Delta. Delta stands for dedication and everlasting love to animals. He took it a step further. He founded Delta Rescue. And if you go to deltarescue.org, you can see some of the amazing work that they do. Just check out those videos. Look at some of the things that they do and the research. It's amazing. It's a no kill sanctuary. You notice I didn't say shelter. It's a sanctuary, dogs, cats, horses. They all roam free. They get the nutrition and the care they need for life. That has been Leo's mission, but it doesn't stop there. Leo wants to make this an enduring mission. All of Delta Rescue runs on our contributions, five, 10, a hundred, a thousand dollars, whatever you can do. But Leo really wants to make sure that this outlasts even him. So if you go to deltarescue.org, you can check out not just the videos, but go to the estate planning kit and think about whether or not helping animals and ensuring that Delta Rescue lives on is part of your mission as well. Go to deltarescue.org, make a contribution, but then download that estate planning kit, deltarescue.org. Check it out now. It really, the reaction is, I think, what a lot of people have when they see this stuff is that, is this happening in the United States of America? Right. Uh, would you see these these types of tactics used and, and a family that, and you know, we check everybody that we have profiled, we've looked into their history uh, and, you know, certainly could not find any justification uh, for considering them to be dangerous or violent. And yet uh, they come away from the whole experience feeling that there was a message meant for them and even more so for others uh, in these raids. And that is, if you go to protest, if you show up and exercise your First Amendment rights and we don't like it, uh, this is what you could be facing. And people should understand this is just SWAT raids. This is ruination. These families, uh, in many cases, their lives were destroyed. They lost their jobs. They lost their income. They had to move. They were They were threatened and doxxed and uh, they try to go find new employment and people would find out and they would make sure the new employers knew, well, these are violent insurrectionists. You shouldn't hire them. So it's uh, it's really got an Orwellian taste to it. Um, 
the, the other thing that I, I mentioned the raids, the, the scope of law enforcement, the, of the FBI that was put on this seemed unbelievable. The, the amount of resources dedicated to going after these people seemed fascinating to me. Um, that, that was something, again, that you realize the magnitude uh, of force that the government put behind this effort. Well, and, and that entire uh, operation, the, the, the tactics that they used, brought out whistleblowers from the FBI, and, and we we profiled two of them in this. Well, film. I want to get yeah, I want to get to uh, that in a second. Yeah, so it, it's you know this this type of a tactic was certainly not universally accepted inside of the bureau, and in fact, even even though there was a purge of conservatives in the FBI that goes back a couple a couple of years, even before January sixth. Um, even with the agents left, there was just a lot of concern about, I can't be a part of something like this because I took an oath. Right. Well, the, you, let's let's go there because you, you brought it up. There's these two FBI whistleblowers. One of them served in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think, if that's right. Uh, the that's other right. one had been a police officer. If I, if I, I mean, but these are like upsetting individuals that are making their concerns known. And, and ultimately, they, they both, I think, one is still on indefinite leave, at least according to the end of the, um, uh, of the documentary there. I, it just, it, it blew my mind because you're not just looking at it from their side. You actually have these whistleblowers who are documenting and telling what's going on inside the bureau, which I thought was a whole fascinating aspect of this that you're really not seeing in other places. Well, and Steve Friend, uh, who had moved from Iowa to Florida, to take on an assignment investigating uh, human trafficking, especially the, the sexual human trafficking of children. That's why he, he took a new assignment down there and was very, very shortly reassigned to doing January 6 cases. And then when he was asked to go on some of these these heavy raids, he objected to it. He said, well, but he also uh, he walks through why it's not just that he objected. Right. He's saying, OK, this is I read the case file. This is what this guy is charged with. Why are we coming in this heavy? And the answer was basically just shut up. Yeah, he, he said he had been involved in apprehension of more than 150 violent criminals and never once had to resort to a SWAT raid. Uh, so he felt so strongly that this was violating his oath that he took when he became an agent that he had to speak up. And he was basically told that he wasn't a team player and was very quickly placed on suspension and his uh, security clearance was revoked. And you can't be an agent if you don't have security clearance. So, you know, he, he felt strongly enough that he stuck with his guns on that. And eventually he left the bureau uh, after, you know, an extended period without a salary uh, that he felt he, he just couldn't do it any longer. Well, it was funny because when he's telling his story, they tell him, right, he says exactly what you did. They, they put my security clearance on hold, which if you don't have a clearance, you can't be an agent. But at least in the document, they never give him a reason. They never explain to him why. What did he do aside from uh, express concerns about their tactics and methods? Right. And I think that, you know, that was a similar case with Garrett O'Boyle, the other uh, special agent that uh, that we profiled. You know, his, oh, his and that case, story, I'll tell you, what, what, what got my heart, like, it was just, he's talking about one point where he's moving his family and they have, you know, the, the, the FBI has got his stuff in storage. I didn't realize that the FBI did that like the military does. They they pack up your, they help move you if you're changing assignments. And his daughter is crying because they're living in an RV and she just says, can I have my bike? And he's heartbroken because the FBI, at least what he's implying is that they're screwing with him in terms of his household goods. And that family ended up living in a, in a camper, in an RV. Uh, and they were thankful for that. Uh, his brother-in-law had uh, had an RV that they could live in, but uh, considering all of their goods were in storage in Virginia, after he had been promoted, got an assignment with a with a team that does surveillance uh, work, and on his first day showing up there, he was uh, he was suspended and his creds were taken. And uh, as he describes in the film, he was going to to uh, take the clip out of his gun, and uh, one of the other agents grabbed his arm. Like, yeah. like he was some sort of a threat and was going to do something. He, he said that, that, still, that still sits with him. But, but the family effects 
when I first interviewed him for a print story, he talked about one of his daughters making a card for him uh, just to encourage him. You know, she could, you know, children always pick up on this, even though they try to shield their daughters from this stuff, uh, that you're, you're, you're going to get your job back, Dad. And it's the most adorable blue uh, marker drawing. And he says this, it's probably his most prized possession, but it, it aches him that his children had to experience any of this. Hey, guys, uh, as a former White House press secretary and a graduate of the U.S. Naval War College, I spent a lot of time thinking through contingency planning. And there's nothing better that you can do for yourself and your family and your loved ones than getting the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. When something goes wrong, a natural disaster, some other thing that attacks our power grid, you will be prepared. The Patriot Generator 2000X is the perfect thing for your house, your family. You can plug in everything, a refrigerator, so if you have medical supplies or food, you will be prepared. All of those other tablets and computers, things that are helpful for you and your family, the Patriot Power Generator 2000X takes care of it. The best part about it is it's portable. You can bring it in your house. You can take it with you on a trip, run it out of your car at a campsite. It doesn't matter. Put it literally in your house and on the counter and power the fridge. You can do it. Plus, it operates off a solar panel, which comes free with your order. You will be prepared. No running to the gas station. No worrying about anything else. The Patriot Power Generator 2000X is your hedge against the inevitable. Go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer to get yours now. You know, you you talked, there's a guy named Tom, um, what's his, Speciale. He's a former domestic terrorism intelligence strategist. He says that there wasn't a single domestic extremist. They were only suspicious. I mean, it's just funny because the, the phrase gets used over and over again. Uh, about trying to to name these people uh, who were there as domestic extremists, but yet there wasn't ultimately a single one. Yeah, and and that's that's a point he made. Of course, you you saw the strong words he used uh, when we played the clip of uh, of the FBI director talking about the increase year to year in domestic extremism cases, and as he put it, that's a lie. Right. He said the, 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 the definition of extremism is undefined. Is, it's undefined. Everybody has their own definition. But when he looked at it, he, and he said he, there, there really aren't any. And yet this whole system has been ginned to create as many cases that you can tie to that as possible. And that's something I know uh, Steve Friend experienced as well, to spread them around the country, open up new cases for anything possible. And then it supports the notion that, you know, people like, you know, traditional Catholics, where the FBI had a bulletin out on them, that these are dangerous people that need to be watched. And, and what it really is doing is it's targeting middle America and just saying, if you love your country, regardless of who you vote for, if you love your country, uh, you're somehow a radical or you're dangerous. You know, one of the things that I thought was fascinating, there's a, a gentleman you interview uh, he's got a U.S. Marine Corps T-shirt on. Uh, I think his name is Bobby Powell. Um, and he shows officials that he had filmed that were doing, I, I don't even know if the, if the word, the proper word is suspicious things. They, they se definitely seem like they're very involved in key aspects of what's happening at the Capitol in terms of letting people in, pulling glass, shattering windows, et cetera. And he films it, puts it all on a thumb drive. And it's, you know, the kids say there's a phrase now, you know, we've got the receipt. And in the movie, in the documentary, he literally pulls out a pocket full of receipts and says, here they are. These are all of the, um, the receipts that I have of mailing this thumb drive with all these photos of these individuals to journalists, to law enforcement. And no one has ever responded to me. And he, you know, says they've never shown up on an FBI sheet or on a most wanted list or anything like that. And yet these people are on film doing things. And I, I couldn't, I was like, wait a second. So of all the people that were charging, you've got a, a, a guy pulling glass. You've got another guy doing some stuff with the barricades. He's documenting this. He puts it on a thumb drive, hands it to everybody. And of all, like, and no one seems to care about this. Well, and the, the FBI and the government has made some references to Bobby Powell and some of the court filings from various cases that basically paints him like he's some kind of a nut. Uh, he's not a nut. 
I mean, he was a witness, and I don't know how else you could describe what he filmed. If that's not suspicious, nothing is. You've got people but who what are, are they, what are they? What is their case? I mean, like, Bobby Powell can be his, look, look, he could be the nuttiest guy in the world. What what comes down to is he's got film and no one disputes it of, right. of individuals doing things. The question that he's asking is the right one. Okay, why are we not going after these individuals? And it seems like you can go after Bobby all you want, but he's his point is the bigger one, which is, and I get why they're doing it, which is look over here, look over here. Right. But what, what he has on film is unquestionable. There are people doing things that, according to him, never show up on most wanted lists that are clearly doing something. And he's correct, because we checked that out when we first uh, interviewed him uh, more than 18 months ago, uh, that the, the, uh, the, the man we now call Capital Glass Man, assigned a, our own hashtag to it, but sedition hunters picked up on, um, you know, he was not on the FBI's January 6th most wanted list. Uh, he didn't show up on sedition hunters, which is kind of a, uh, let's say a front group, but they, they tend to do similar work as the FBI, but they're all uh, supposedly volunteers. But uh, eventually they did pick up on him, but it wasn't for a long time. Uh, so there, there was nobody seeking this guy, despite this video that he was jumping up and down. He took it first to the FBI. That was the first place he went to was the uh, JTTF. And, uh, and he said he was ignored and, and made multiple attempts. So then he tried to go public, tried to go to lawmakers. You know, we were one of the first that, uh, that featured him and, and talked to him and, and did his story. But, uh, you know, this is a guy who's given up everything. He yeah. lost his but, house. But again, I go back to this idea of you're going after some of these bit players that did. I'm not excusing anyone's behavior, but here's somebody in the video that you can see breaking a window, doing other things, and yet no one's going after them. And it's part of a pattern, and that's why they. Right. That's why it's significant. But so, is as a, there, what, what do you? What, what isn't something going off in your head saying, "Okay, this doesn't add up." We're going after these folks and this folks and this family, but not this guy. Yeah. What's the commonality? And that's something that we continue to look at. And the two gentlemen that he filmed fit right in the pattern. We call them so suspicious what's, what's, actors. Okay, give me, what, what have you, what, what can you tell us though? What, do, what is it? I mean, I still don't get this. I'm watching this and I'm, it's like a, you know, one of the, a, a mystery movie where at the end, I'm like, I, like, tell me what, what is going on here? Because we still don't have an answer. Who are those people? And why does the FBI not care about it? Well, one of the one of the worst agitators of the entire day is a man still known only by a hashtag called Red on Red Glasses, uh, and he was really he was the one who breached the Capitol first. He took a you know ten to twelve foot long two by four and sailed it through uh, the Senate wing door window, and that was that was the first incursion of the Capitol. And it was after that that Dominic Pozzola, the Proud Boy, took a shield and smashed the window. But uh, this fellow, red on red glasses, he's all over. We have video of him all over the place. He was in the uh, in the hallway where Ashley Babbitt was shot. And on his way there, he was trying to kick in some of the, uh, the house doors, uh, doing bicycle uh, taekwondo kicks. So I, I don't know of anybody that did more in more places who... While he, he is on the FBI's list, he hasn't been identified. And that alone is, given the technology today, that alone right. is very suspicious. I suspect they know exactly who he is, but he has not been uh, publicly identified or arrested. Talk to me about the case of, of Ronald uh, McAbee and his wife. Like, I, I thought that was interesting. You know, there's actually an update to, to that oh, case good. that I'm working working on today, a story that the government is recommending that he go to prison for 14 years. All right, so walk and back. That, Explain to the audience who he is and what he did. Ronald McAbee, at the time, on January 6th, was a sheriff's deputy from Tennessee, and he went to the Capitol for the same reason most people did, felt called to go there. Uh, and he ended up on the Lower West Terrace, where the tunnel entrance is to the Capitol. That was the site of some of the worst violence, and he ended up in the middle of just a melee. Uh, but what he did was to try to save a young woman, Roseanne Boyland, who had uh, been shot with a pepper ball and then 
and then uh, trampled. And he was trying to get them to help her, the police, and then trying to help her directly. Uh, and in the, you know, he was charged with, I think, seven or eight uh, counts. And some of them were assaulting police. Uh, others were, you know, the standard uh, being in a restricted area type of thing. Uh, and he was, he pled guilty to two because he felt that they could convince a jury that those two, uh, but then he went to trial on the other five. And he but was correct me, from wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, that didn't, so they first start off in like Tennessee or whatever, right? And the judge says, okay, we're going to adjudicate this. And then they bring him up to DC. Is that right? When it got moved to uh, DC, it was a complete shift. The judge called him a terrorist. So it appears clearly to this court that the defendant is pulling the officer back into the crowd of other terrorists. The defendant, who's never testified, never said a word to the court, and the court, without any information, has just concluded my client's a terrorist. He was arrested in Tennessee, and he was brought before a magistrate judge in the Middle District of Tennessee, Judge Friendsley, who uh, chastised the DOJ and, and said, uh, I don't see it. You want this right. man to be detained. And he said, I do not see him as a danger. If he was a danger, why did you wait nine months to arrest him? And why did you wait 30 days after you had authorization to arrest him? So he really slapped them a bit and said, I don't, I don't believe he's a danger. And, uh, and he didn't even have all the, the proper evidence before him because the, the DOJ withheld the audio on that very crucial video that they showed. Um, but that was immediately appealed and Judge Emmett Sullivan uh, overruled that and eventually held a hearing. Um, and he's a he's a judge who called Maccabee a terrorist. He was supposed yeah. to be impartial and he referred to him as one of the terrorists. Um, now, eventually he got removed from the case, but this is just kind of the twists and turns that you see in these. And, uh, you know, you really look at the evidence Maccabee was trying to help, and he's not getting given credit for that. And in fact, 14 years would rank him in the top seven or eight in terms of all the sentences handed down. Uh, I'll be surprised if Judge Rudolph Contreras actually goes along with that recommendation, but but that's what they're pushing for. And his wife still, I, she comes up and visits him, but she at, at least at one point she gets an hour with him uh, over a very prolonged period of time. Um, and it just, it, it seems like, again, the, at least the video I see, I don't know the extent of it. You're the expert on this, but like he, there's the, the alleged action it, it, from what I gathered was that there was a baton that he may have touched for four, like uh, approximately four seconds, but there's no evidence that he actually struck anyone or hurt anyone or did anything like that. No. And the, the motorcycle gloves that he wore that had reinforced knuckles, uh, the, the Department of Justice considers a deadly weapon, although they did not have any evidence that he used that part of his gloves against anyone. Uh, but in it's, it's, I think, a dubious claim that, that reinforced motorcycle gloves, which you can buy on Amazon, uh, they're legal to have in the District of Columbia. Uh, you know, these were not brass knuckles or anything like that. Uh, yet that put him into the enhanced punishment territory that takes his his case from like 24 months up to 14 years. That that uh, you know, and and they've tried they tried to make that point that you can't call motorcycle gloves a deadly weapon. But so far, judges have gone along with these types of things in these cases. So. Walk me through for these. For, I mean, I, I obviously you, you profile the Munn family, Mac, like some of these folks in the movie. But generally speaking, it seems like the, the a lot of these folks who d didn't who would normally be charged with some kind of misdemeanor entering or something are getting sentences well beyond what a normal. Again, I'm not excusing like if you illegally go in somewhere or disrupt something, that's one thing. But for the for if that action occurred normally, right? We saw protesters um, talking over a house building the other day that were upset with with what's going on in Israel. They're being charged probably with a misdemeanor and then released. What? Where does where do the sentences come down for a lot of these folks versus you know the everyday sentence that gets handed down for somebody that disrupts or illegally enters a, a government building? Well, what we've been told by a lot of defense attorneys is 
one thing missing in all of this is the prosecutorial discretion. And again, this, this really comes down to common sense. Uh, because of the location of this event, that has put all of this in its own category. And uh, defense attorneys have made this argument that because of that, it's become at least a two-tiered justice system. And they point to, judges hate it when they do this, but they point to uh, Trump's inauguration in 2017 when there was rioting. It was declared rioting. It involved firebombing. Uh, they torched limousines. They trashed storefronts. They smashed in glass. There were 200 arrests. Uh, most of those uh, were never uh, pursued into any uh, any kind of prosecution. You compare that, which is in this you know the same locality, uh, with what happened on January 6th, and there's there's a disconnect. And you know, not to mention the the Portland federal courthouse, which was firebombed for. 148 or something nights in a row, uh, they look at these things and say, wait a minute, why the different treatment? These are federal charges. So why, because you were at the Capitol, even if you committed a violent crime, shoved a police officer, threw a punch, uh, what have you, um, you're getting 10, 12, 14 years in prison. Isn't there, isn't there something missing in terms of perspective and common sense? Uh, does a long stretch in prison like that really fit the crime. And that was where I, I sort of look at it again. And I, again, I go back to how you started this, uh, the documentary, which is you're, you're not looking to condone anything and the people did bad things, but there is this seemingly two tier sense of justice where if you do one thing uh, as a liberal, BLM protests, et cetera, protest Trump, uh, you probably don't get anything. And if you do, it's minimal. But if you engaged in something at the Capitol uh, in support of something that President Trump did, uh, then, well, my goodness, you're going to go down a, a very deep rabbit hole. Uh, and that's where I, I sort of looked at the disconnect and said, uh, again, not excusing the behavior, but for a lot of these folks, considering what they did, they're getting a much, uh, 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 you know, a punishment in excess of it. Talk to me, though, a little bit just uh, about the conditions that these people are in. There's a lot of people who are calling them uh, prisoners and hostages. I think that's what the president referred to. For the folks that are in jail right now, are they getting due process? Well, uh, I think you could argue they're not. I mean, you have a number of men that have been in pretrial detention for more than three years. Now, pretrial detention is supposed to be a rarity, and they're only supposed to detain you if you're so dangerous or so violent that there is no set of circumstances, no set of uh, conditions a judge would, would impose, be it ankle monitoring, be it restriction to your home, whatever, whatever the case may be. They can't craft a solution to keep society safe from you until you come to trial. Now, that's supposed to be a rarity in January well, 6th. And, and I assume for like a violent, a violent criminal who would pose a threat to their community or themselves or their family. But even then, we've, you've, you see cases that involve uh, alleged homicides where people uh, are not held uh, until trial. So it's, you know, the, the, the disconnect includes these things, uh, folks in long stretches of pretrial detention. Yeah. And during that time, there have been quite a few of them that have suffered, uh, you know, and I think you'd have a hard time arguing that it wasn't a form of torture. People who were severely beaten, uh, you know, dropped on their head, uh, you know, by a couple of guards uh, and hit the concrete and their brain's never the same. You know, there have been uh, reports assembled by defense attorneys uh, that chronicled this stuff. And Marjorie Taylor Greene put out a report with some of the same information, especially in the first 18 months after January 6th. Uh, since there's been a lot of publicity, these things aren't, uh, aren't as common. But, uh, you know, that just adds a whole nother dimension to it. Uh, you think, wait a minute, how could this, guards who do these things should be, uh, there should be a grand jury investigation and there should be prosecutions, yet you're not going to see that. No. Um, what's the one takeaway, if you had to give someone an elevator speech on why it's worth the whatever hour and 30 minutes to watch this, what do you want people to take away from it? Well, that we're still trying to determine the January 6th story. It's not of, you know, it's not been defined. And uh, 
uh, if you accept whether it's the information we present or the uh, the corporate media narrative, uh, I can tell you it's just it's not complete, and that people should maintain as healthy skepticism, do their own research, do their own homework. Uh, I think it's going to take all of us. Um, years to really dig through all this stuff, to, to go down the rabbit holes, to figure out what's real, uh, you know, what is a quote unquote conspiracy theory. There's a lot of work to do. So any notion that this is uh, this has all been settled um, is is ridiculous. And, and Congress really has uh, uh, the Republicans in the House are, are starting uh, belatedly starting to do some investigations, but uh, they need more of that. and. They really should do it with urgency because they got the, the subpoena power uh, to get at some of this stuff that journalists just can't do. Okay. Joe, thanks for being with us and for uh, for the great reporting on this. I urge everyone to take a look at it as, again. The links are in our bio. Thank you all for tuning in. Later this week, Victor Davis Hanson will be with us. Uh, Governor Mike Huckabee with us. We got a big week lined up. Continue to subscribe. Make sure you hit that notification button. Go to Apple, give us a five stars review, and we'll see you back here tomorrow on The Sean Pfizer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.